everybody, and welcome again to Nerd to the Third Power, your one-stop shop for all things nerdy and awesome. I'm your host and master of ceremonies, Dr. Gonzo. With me, as always, in this epic quest of awesomeness is our resident anime gods, the cat. Cat, how are you doing this week? I'm doing great. I'm actually good. I am taking a week of very much needed vacation, and I, I have done nothing productive all day, and it feels awesome. <laughs> all right, all right. So uh yeah, getting some of that, getting 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 some of that R and R in, huh? I needed it so badly. So badly. <laughs> yeah, uh the, 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 she, she she's not kidding from based on everything that uh that that she's put on social media about uh her about her work situation right now. It sounds like she's pretty much been through Iwo Jima. Go, I wouldn't quite go that far, but it has been it has been a time. It, nope, it will nope. be a t- Nobody's died, but not for lack of trying. <laughs> right. Like I definitely came close a couple of times. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been ugh, it's been a really rough time over the last few months. And um work basically said you need to take a vacation and get your number of vacation hours down. So I was like, okay, twist my arm a little bit. <laughs> Don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> right. Um, so I decided I would take off uh, this week for a couple of days and uh, just rest up. And I don't know if I'm capable of recharging my batteries or if I've just permanently been tired since 2002. But um, I'm, I'm just ready to do nothing for days. <laughs> All right. And uh, Mike, how are you doing this week? I have started a home for wayward lizards. I am well. Didn't see that one coming, did you, fucker? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I'm good. I am playing the the Avengers on uh, PlayStation 4. Going through that, I am going to be talking on a podcast later, later this week about my favorite uh, movie of all time, Aliens, and... Uh, Pretty excited that opened up a few press contacts for me, and I got that awesome new book from Titan Books, Aliens, The Making, and uh, or The Making of Aliens, and it's fucking cool. So uh, I'm having a pretty good week, actually. All right, all right. So we got a fun show for you guys tonight. Tonight we are discussing Nickelodeon. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the early history of the network, and uh, we've each picked uh, a Nick show uh, to, from our childhoods to uh, to rewatch and talk about, and uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, in Cat's case, she's actually chosen two, so we're going to have a bit of a double feature there. So, but of course, there is procedure to follow. As always, we're going to start with Ask a Geek, and our first question here, this one comes from Erica, and uh, her question is for me, and uh, her question is, having had my first experience with Dungeons & Dragons through Fools Who Ride, are there any other games or modules that I would be interested in trying out? And, uh, well, uh, I mean... This is well, yeah. Fool's Who Ride is my first experience with Dungeons and Dragons itself. It's not the first pen and paper RPG I've ever played. I think I mentioned for a while that I was in a group that played a Warhammer 40k RPG called Dark Heresy for a while. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, would love picking that back up again at some point. Um, but unfortunately, the group scattered to the the four winds um, due to the demands of life, and I don't think I could convince the rest of, the rest of this team to play it. Um, I have been interested in trying out the Star Wars RPG, um, but I kind of want to get a, a, a few more uh, games of Dungeons and Dragons under my belt so I can get used to that system. Because um, I'm one of those people who it takes or it takes a, a while for me to learn a game system because um, I'm just not used to to you know pen and paper RPGs. You, you put a video game in my hands and I'll have it known. Ba- I'll know it back to back to backwards to forwards in about ten minutes, but. You put me in front of a, a, a D20 system, I'm like, okay, all right, wh- what do all these numbers mean? I, I have I have no idea. Um, I, no one told me there'd be math. If I were to introduce you to Star Wars, I would use the Star Wars West End game systems from the 1990s. Very, very well supported, which is the basis for the Star Wars EU today. The Fantasy Flight game is fine, but unless you want to go out and buy specialty dice that I don't have, um, no. Um... And there is a D20 version of Star Wars, but it, it's not very good. Um, it does have its fans, but its fluff is very well written. But yeah, I would do D20 Star, or I would do Star Wars D6. I can teach you that in 15 minutes. 
So, and then uh, I, I think Cat has mentioned a few times has mentioned to me a few times Vampire the Masquerade, and she said that that would be up my alley. Um, don't know where she got that idea from. Uh, I don't recall being real hopped up on vampires. Well, I mean, unless you count Castlevania. But uh, I mean, I don't know. I might, I might be willing to give that a shot at some point down the line. And then um, I've actually got a coworker um, for for reference. I work in cybersecurity, and uh, he thinks that uh, that I would find a lot of enjoyment out of Shadowrun because of the demands of my job. Oh yeah, but you would be playing one of the character classes that every game master fucking dreads, and that is the Decker class. Um. But you would make an interesting Decker character because you understand the theory of cybersecurity, which means you could rules lawyer us to death in theory. So <laughs> you would be a fun and annoying player. <laughs> well, maybe maybe we'll do that for a, a Fools Who Ride sideshow. I would love to do Shadowrun with you guys. It's basically what if the Matrix had trolls and elves in it, and it would be a remarkably fun time. So... If you want to play Lord of the Rings with a fucking minigun, I'm your guy. Okay. All right. And then, uh, all right. So, he, and then here's a, she's got a second question here for Kat and Mike. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a little leery of asking this one. Cause, uh, the question is what has been the, what has been the most irritating thing about teaching Gonzo about D and D? I don't think there's anything really irritating. I think you just have to learn player roles at the table, and that's not overshadowing the conversation with your other players, and that's just understanding how everybody works, and that's just finding the group dynamic. Ultimately, we're not that far into a campaign, so we know each other's kind of mannerisms. Recording a podcast is very different from running a game, so you just have to learn to let people take their turn. That would be the only really big suggestion. You've picked up on the math fairly well and you think on your feet fairly well, but maybe you don't give Cat and Skyblaze enough to do sometimes. That would be my only thing. Cat, what do you think? I, I would actually agree with that. Um, there's there's nothing really obnoxious about teaching somebody a new game. Uh, in my opinion, it's um, like we've all been there. We've all been the person who is new at the thing. So we are very sympathetic to the idea that, yeah, this is going to take some time to learn because it's like you said, there's a lot of math involved and that's not, it's not always really fun. Um, but l like, like Birdman said, you know, just, you know, uh, learning to give other people a chance and um, learning, I guess, uh, what what the bounds of what your character is allowed to do, you know, in terms of controlling the rest of the world. Like, you can affect your character, but you can't affect what other people's characters do. And that's not always the easiest thing to learn. But, yeah. Okay. All right. And her third question: What is uh, something that you guys have been surprised that I've been that I've picked up on pretty easily? Um, uh, I guess I'm... she answered because she figured because she figured you guys were just going to beat the hell out of me with the second question. She, you know, <laughs> want to give me a little ego boost so I don't come out of this, you know, completely feeling down. I think you've picked <laughs> up. I think you've picked up on the role playing fairly well. I, I think you've picked up on the world that I've set out for you fairly well. I mean, overall, I'm pretty pleased with the way Fools Who Ride turned out other than a misunderstanding with the rules, and that's totally on my behalf, but fuck. That, ep uh, that, ep that episode just came out, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> so, no! Oh so, yeah, that, so yeah, that, <laughs> that was a fun time of misreading a rule, so should wear my glasses. Um, but no, you've picked it up pretty well i would say you work well with the group dynamic that we have um yeah i mean overall i don't have any major complaints about you i think you're learning well i think you're i think you'll pick up other role-playing systems just as easily um you just have to get over that fear of this is math this is scary and um yeah i mean overall i think you're more adaptable than what you think you are Okay, all right. I appreciate that. I, okay. I don't. I don't really disagree with anything that Mike said. I think it's uh, very, very much the same. I think you picked up on the role playing part really, really quickly, and you really uh, uh, committed to it, like hardcore. Like, here's what we're gonna do. Here's my character. 
Um, and then like understanding how the role playing part works, I think you picked up on really well. I, I can't shit on you for that, my friend. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, and uh, let's see here now. Uh, next question here. Uh, this comes uh, from Ryan, and uh, his question is for you, Cat. And it's uh, when, God willing, uh, conventions start opening up again. Uh, what is the first thing you're going to do at the first con that you go to? Oh my God! We're going to assume that it's not one that you're running. <laughs> Lick every doorknob, sir. Oh my! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I gen- generally actually don't go to conventions unless I'm running them. Um, but, um, I, okay, so just imagining myself, even if it's at my own convention that I run, um, the first thing that I want to do besides wash my hands <laughs> is, um, I can't wait to walk through a dealer's room and just, like, watch people. I know it's creepy, but, like... I love people watching at conventions. It's like one of my favorite things to do because as a showrunner, um, somebody who's running a convention, it brings me a lot of satisfaction to watch people as they're enjoying this thing that I help bring together. And um, the dealer's room is one of my favorite places to be because it's really high energy area where people are like freaking out about this cool thing that they found. And I love just like standing off to the side or chatting with a vendor or somebody that I know and just like just marveling at all the people who are out there enjoying themselves. This is really, really cheesy, but this is really how my mindset is. So I can't wait to go to a convention again and just see people enjoying themselves. Okay. And he's got a second question for me and that's uh, how has, how has the lockdown and quarantine affected my game collecting? Uh, I'm doing a lot of online shopping. (laughs) Um, which I don't, which I, I mean, it, I, I don't really like doing a whole lot of online shopping, um, like, you know, doing the eBay stuff, unless I'm looking for something really hyper specific. Um, to me, the fun of collecting is actually going out to the stores and digging through the shelves and, you know, searching for, you know, some hidden gems or something that I've been really looking for, or stumbling across something that I've really been looking forward to and then sobbing uncontrollably when I can't afford it. <laughs> oh, a copy of Snatcher that that's that's gonna that's gonna hurt for a while. Um, I mentioned because of quarantine, I actually picked up physical game collecting again. Really, slightly, ever so slightly. I was able to get a PlayStation Three a couple of weeks ago, and I was able to rescue some games off of my uh, PlayStation account, like uh, the Marvel fighting games. Uh, and the main reason I bought the console, I got it really cheap. I wanted Scott Pilgrim versus the world because I never want to lose that. But I went out and bought a bunch of games via Facebook marketplace because I like the grand idiots of this show decided to rebuy with my own money, aliens, colonial Marines, because I just really want to shoot a pulse rifle. I bought metal gear solid four again, because that game has never been ported. I bought persona Four arena and I bought aliens versus predator. Man, Persona 4 really irritates me because, all right, so you know you know how the Xbox One is backwards compatible with some 360 games? Mm-hmm. Okay, it's backwards compatible with Persona 4 Arena, the base game, but it's not compatible with the Ultramax re-release that came out like a year or so later, and that's the one I have. So, so if I want to play backwards. Persona so if I want to play Persona 4 Arena in glorious, in glorious high definition on my 4K television, I'm fucked! Because I don't have the version that is compatible with my Xbox One. If they made a Persona 5 fighting game, I'd be all over that. I'm, I'm actually honestly surprised, just side note here, that we haven't, that we still haven't gotten a date for Persona 5 Strikers in the West. I am so surprised. You mean Persona like, 5 Scramble? Whatever the fuck it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm honestly surprised we haven't gotten it. Like, we didn't see it at Gamescom. We didn't see it during that Nintendo Partner Direct. Just... It's just, we know it's coming. We just don't know when. So, eh, give me my fucking Persona 5. Well, I mean, we didn't get we didn't get a date for Persona 5 Royal until like four months before it was released. Yeah. I mean, there's still so hope. That's just, Maybe that's just Atlas. So. <laughs> so, and I mean, we only just like, I think it was like, like two or three weeks ago, finally got a release date for Shin Megami Tensei 5. And how long have they been hyping that up? 
2017, I think. So yeah, it's been a while. But uh, yeah. Anyway, continuing. Um, but yeah, no. Um, the, the the thing that I enjoy most about collecting is actually going to the stores and talking to people and digging through the shelves. And I've been able to do some of that. Um, because Maryland is no longer under total quarantine. Um, so there are some shops that are open up for limited capacity. Um, and there, there's one that I go to that you actually have to make an appointment <laughs> if you want to go in because the, the shop is actually so so small and cramped that social distancing is like an impossibility. So you've got like, okay, I'm going to come up at this time and I'm going to be there for like 30 minutes, you know, and you have to you have to actually you have to actually like put down a, a pre-purchase on something so that you don't just come up there and loiter for 30 minutes. Um it's it's kind of insane, but you know these are the times that we live in. <laughs> um, but you know I haven't been able to go up and make a circuit up like up through Pennsylvania, which is where I do you know a lot of my really big game shopping. Um, so most of the stuff that I've been adding to my collection now is mostly newer stuff that I've got on pre order or stuff that I missed out on its initial release that I'll, I'll go up to Best Buy now that they're open and pick up on sale. Um, I just added a, a Ring Fit Adventure to my collection. <laughs> Actually, that's gonna be that's gonna be coming in the mail tomorrow, um, and I actually bought that to actually use and exercise because I the, the pools are still closed and I'm a fat fucking bastard who's trying to lose a hundred pounds and I'm kind of a little frustrated that I can't uh, can't get my exercise on. A diet can only go so far. But anyway, but that's all the questions that we have for Ask a Geek this week. Thank you as always for sending them in. As always, you can send them to us through the email at drgonzo at nerd of the third We love getting your questions, love reading them on the air. So go ahead and get your questions in, and you just might get yours read on the show. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. All right. And now for the main event. So, Nickelodeon. I think it's safe to say that uh, everyone here under the age of 50. Uh, has grown up with Nickelodeon in some form or another. We have all, it's all been a part of our childhoods, uh, whether it be watching SpongeBob marathons or, you know, watching Avatar The Last Airbender in your college years. Nickelodeon has been a part of our lives uh, at some point. And so uh, we thought that it would be fun since uh, a major anniversary for Nickelodeon is coming up. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I think it's like their 31st or something. I don't know. Um, but anyway, we thought it would be fun. Uh, to talk about the network and uh, some of its history. And we also did kind of the same thing that we did uh, with... Fuck, I can't remember what what, 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 were we, what were we talking about the last time we each picked out a show to watch. Like that Disney afternoon. Yeah, the Disney show. afternoon. Yeah, and like with the Disney afternoon, we thought... And like with the Disney afternoon... God, this is, this is how 2020 has fucked with me. I can't even remember what we did like a month ago. Uh, my brain is sushi. All right. So anyway, we thought it'd be fun, much like with the Disney Afternoon Show, we thought it'd be fun to each pick a Nickelodeon show uh, from our childhoods, rewatch them, see how they hold up, and talk about them. So uh, I guess uh, let's just get right into that. So of course, you know, some, some of the early history of Nickelodeon started in the late 80s as a, as a network called Pinwheel, uh, named after its its flagship show. And then, you know, it, it started off as most network, most cable networks do, you know, foreign shows and, syndic- and reruns and syndication um, before branching out and creating its own content in the form of Nicktoons and uh, other shows like All That, Are You Afraid of the Dark, Clerks Explains It All, and uh, I think we all remember the gloriousness uh, that was the Saturday Night Snick Block. Well, ah. th- there was a lot of like early history that maybe you're just kind of glossing over. Um, just because this this came out in a very early era of cable, coming out of the late seventies into the eighties, like this, like Nickelodeon only used to be on for certain hours of the day, and then it would turn off, which is weird. I've never ever heard that happen before uh, in like uh, cable. So you're right; like they'd show a lot of reruns. Pinwheel was one of their primary shows they had because it was very very easy to produce. It was cheap. Um, they showed a lot of shows from Canada. In fact, one of your favorites, I believe, is You Can't Do That on Television, which is which was made yes. up in Ottawa. Fantastic show. If um, anyone knows where I can find a complete online archive of You Can't Do That on Television, please, for the love of God, send me an email. I've been searching for years. I don't think that show ever got a DVD release. It did not due to rights clearances, due to contracts being lost in fires. It has a very interesting and complicated history than you might imagine. Um, there's actually a fantastic two and a half hour documentary on it 
on YouTube. And one of the channels that I really want to highlight, especially in the beginning of the show, there's a YouTube channel called Pop Arena. He does a show called Knickknacks where he looks through each year of Nickelodeon and will give you a 20 to to over an hour and a half or longer documentary on each show. He will talk about Leave it to Beaver, the Donna Reed show. Uh, he just did one on Double Dare, which was an hour and a half. He did You Can't Do That on Television, which I think was about two hours. Some fantastic information in there. But yeah, so Nickelodeon came out of this unique time, and it was a loss for many, many years. It wasn't making any money, and there was thought of pulling the plug. But then, th- but then lightning struck in a bottle when some of the things like Nick at Night started really hitting, when the original programming started hitting, especially as you mentioned in the 1990s with a lot of the Nick tunes, things really started going. There was Nickelodeon Studios in Florida. There was um, studios in Hollywood, New York. Philadelphia had its own Nickelodeon studio for quite some time, which I didn't know about up until recently. So there's a little and, bit of history for you. Go on, though. And, 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 one, of the, and one of the things is that, that, that people tend to forget now, especially nowadays that we have so many of these, these types of networks, is it was the first television network geared specifically for kids throughout its whole daytime broadcasting. There was no other channel that did this at the time. I think I think Nickelodeon even predates Disney Channel, you know. Which even then that was more kind of overall family viewing. But Nickelodeon was, you know, when they say they're the first network for kids, they really mean it. And it was unlike anything else that came out at the time. And uh, it just, I remember, I remember. See, I'm, I, this is this is how old I am. I remember, uh, you know, back when Nickelodeon first swapped over from the old rainbow logo to the the orange splat logo and they had shows like eureka's castle um Mm -hmm. david the gnome uh the little koala which i just learned a couple years ago was actually an anime from japan so if you really want to get technical the little koala was the first anime i ever watched it four years old (laughs) before before i even knew what anime was and uh, actually, Nickelodeon had a bit of a fascination with koalas in those days because they had they had they had the little koala, which is about this little blue koala, hence the title. And then there was another one. I can't remember the name in, uh, off the top of my head. Um, Wiki koala, maybe. Is that the one with the girl named Sandy? And the koalas are from another dimension where everybody's flying around in like this void. And apparently, I, like like the koala dimension is going to invade Earth or something. Maybe like it, that's, that's literally literally the only thing I remember is was that it was about this girl named Sandy who had she she had these two koala friends who were from another dimension called Koala Walla Land. If somebody knows the name of this, please let me know because now that I've started talking about this, this is going to fucking bug me all goddamn night. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I remember I remember David the Gnome. I remember uh, I remember it had Danger Mouse. It had Count Duckula, the the, the Cosgrove Hall cartoons. Uh, uh, man, I wish Skyblaze was here for this one because they could probably uh, go on at length about those. Maya the Bee. Maya the Bee, like yeah. Lost Cities um, of Gold, which is fucking fantastic. We didn't have that down here for some reason. Which is so weird because I used to watch Nickelodeon on a satellite feed. And I'm talking, I had a satellite disc that was like 15 feet across in my backyard. And that's how I used to watch um, Nickelodeon from a pirate radio signal. But it, it worked. Um, Either, well, yeah. I, I, I should, I, maybe I should. Say, I don't. I, I, I maybe I shouldn't say. Well, because another thing is, you're older than I am. Yeah, I'm. So almost maybe old. when you. So maybe when you were watching Nickelodeon, they had it, but they didn't have it when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. So maybe it just predates me. But I yeah, don't remember but, ever watching Lost Cities of Gold. Yeah, because the Nickelodeon programming blocks would constantly change. Because, for example, when I was growing up, I could watch David the Gnome. Maya the Bee, The Littles, um, that koala show you mentioned, Lost Cities of Gold. But I watched a lot of Nick at Night. So I'd watch Leave it to Beaver, The Donna Reed Show, My Two Sons, stuff like that. Um, Lassie, stuff like that. And there's a lot of weird history with like Nickelodeon and some of these shows. Like, there's actually a history of child abuse with some of them, but that's not Nick's fault because these shows were produced in the 50s and 60s. But Nickelodeon, they would do everything. They even had their own like video music show at one point. They had skit shows, which I know Kat's going to talk about some of those, or she was going to. She's talking about Cl- Clarissa and Are You Afraid of the Dark? which features some Canadian town in it, who's a weatherman up here. 
Um, but I'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, like I remember watching Star Trek the anime series on Nickelodeon, and that's that was my first introduction to Star Trek. Oh man, but anyway, I know but, it's so weird. But it was, but you know, Nickelodeon hit its its stride in the 90s with the introduction of its original programming and uh, that was a rule that we set out for ourselves when we decided we were going to do this topic because we were going to pick uh, original Nickelodeon shows uh, and watch and talk about them and uh, you know in, and see how they held up and uh, you know so we, uh, let's just go ahead and uh, just get started on that so uh, Kat you uh, you had a couple that you, uh, you picked out so w- which, which shows did you pick and why? Okay, so um, I was originally, I really wanted to do Roundhouse. Um, Another one I would love to find the complete online archive right? of. Um, and, and then I was like, oh no, I'm definitely not going to find Roundhouse. Um, let me do all that. And then I was like, fuck it, you ju- you're just going to end up watching Clarissa Explains It All. Just go watch Clarissa Explains It All. <laughs> um, so I watched Clarissa Explains It All. I didn't get through, like, obviously all five seasons, given that my first uh, moment of free time was uh, yesterday. Um, but so, so, so fun story with this. Uh, we were originally going to have her watch. She was originally going to watch us on Verve, which had Nick, a Nick Splat channel, and I gave her my login to to use it, so she would have to pay for herself. Literally three days ago, Verve removed all their Nickelodeon programming <laughs> as we record this. Uh, so, we, so we had to we had to jury rig something. But I'm sorry. Go ahead, continue. Yeah. So I sat down and I watched um, a bit of Clarissa Explains It All. And this was one of my favorite shows when I was younger. Um, I didn't have, I don't, I didn't have as long and lauded a history with like Nickelodeon shows as many of my peers because I was stationed overseas. My family was stationed overseas when I was younger and we didn't move to a place with a good cable package until the mid 90s. Um, so I, you know, I didn't, I didn't watch these, these shows as they were airing or anything like that because we didn't have cable or anything. We had, we, we never like had more than like 10 channels until we moved to the mainland U.S. And that was like in 95 or so. Um, so I missed out on a lot of television when I was younger. Um, but Clarissa Explains It All was a show that I very much loved. I must have been watching, like, tons of reruns of it, because I think it did a majority of its airing between, like, 91 and 95, or 91 to 94 or so. Um, so I've watched, like, a smattering of episodes over the course of several years, but, um... I don't know. Do we need to explain what the plot is or anything like that, or are we just, ta- are we just assuming that people well, know what it's uh... about? Well, I mean, I'm I'm sure that the uh, the old fossils like us know exactly what you're talking about. But for for the young bucks who who still had their baby teeth, uh, what what oh, what, what, yes. what was the plot of Clarissa explains it all? Okay. Such as it was. <laughs> My young friends <laughs> who are listening to us old people talk about TV shows, Clarissa explains it all was um, Melissa Joan Hart when she was like quite young, and it was a sitcom series of. Um, Clarissa Darling and her family and the a good good chunk of it is actually her character talking to the audience and I feel like that really kind of set it apart but it's Clarissa's point of view from everything and it wasn't you know there was other shows around the time that was like Blossom and Full House and stuff like that and this was like a more uh, single person centric version of the same kinds of topics that would be covered in a show like Full House, where there's a family, you know, situation, and here's we're going to cover topics of interest for young people in that time period. But it's all centered around Melissa Jones Hart's character, and a lot of it is her getting into some dramatic situation, usually of her own making. Um, her best friend Sam who crawls uh, up a ladder to get to her window every single day for no reason at all whatsoever. I still have that guitar riff in my head every time. Yes, it, it, every yes, time. it sticks with you forever. Can, can I just say, the music the music in that show still slaps 30 years later. I still have the theme song stuck in my head. Nah, oh my nah, 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 nah. It's never going away. Like, since re-watching <laughs> this, it's like, okay. I'm going to be going out and finding some fucking heavy metal remix of this or something later as soon as we're finished recording. Ten bucks says I can find one before we finish the sh- finish recording. Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it's just a, you know, a, 
a little bit of a coming of age story, but there's not really too much of an overarching storyline. It's just the day to day adventures of Clarissa Darling, um, mostly following around um, her relationship with her family and her best friend and her rival rivalry with her brother Ferguson. Um, <laughs> and, and there's a lot of stuff in it that, uh, you know, it's it's quite funny, um, it's quite cute, uh, but it is really very much a product of its time. And, um, like, I loved this stuff as a kid, and everybody, like, I know was like, oh, Clarissa's so cool because she's highly fashionable and very relatable for girls. Um, but I think a lot of guys, like, a lot of boys watched this show as well because it was I did. fun. Like, like... I think it was a little revolutionary in in that respect that it had a a a girl lead but it very much was good for everyone to watch. It wasn't like, oh, I'm a girl and now we're only going to talk about girl stuff because we have to market it to the girls. It was like every preteen could watch this and and you know, relate to it in some way. And I think um, that really paved the way for other shows to have girl leads like um, like the the Secret Life of Alex Mack and stuff like that. So it it really did a great job of of introducing, you know, us to a female lead for a show that anyone could enjoy. Um, and it was really, I guess, it was the first big series that Melissa Joan Hart worked on. I don't know if she worked on anything when she was younger. And then obviously she got quite famous from that show and ended up doing uh, Sabrina and, uh, you know, a very successful career, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at her. She, she'd done a few guest. I'm looking at her Wikipedia page. She'd seen she'd done a few guest uh, starring roles. But yeah, Clarissa Explains It All was her first her first lead role. And uh, yeah, um, I, the thing I remember the most about Clarissa Explains It All uh, from when I was a kid, um, because I watched it in its initial airing, was it was the only live action Nickelodeon show at, you know, between the ages of four to seven that I actually liked because I was all about cartoons as a kid. You Hell know, yeah. if, if, if there wasn't, you know, an animated anvil falling on somebody's head, I wasn't interested. Um, but Clarissa, I actually really liked, even though, you know, like I said, between four and seven years old, most of the, 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 to the topics just flew over my head. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it, it really is it, it, amazing to go back and see, you know, just how, cause I, I went back and watched a, a few episodes myself, uh, on the Amazon prime thing, just out of curiosity, how it's, how it stands up, like how, how, you know, the things that it talks about, you know, it's very easy for shows to for shows to discuss topics that are very set in their time and also very heavy handed. But it's 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 amazing how both casual and and timeless Clarissa is. Like it's not it's not one of those it's, it's not it doesn't, it doesn't do like shows like, like a lot of shows like Full House or something where they just kind of beat you over the head and with the with the moral and there's like you know the everybody reconciles at the end and there's the sweet violin music you know you didn't get that with clarissa and it's also worth pointing out that clarissa was mm, it wasn't really that afraid to tackle a couple of things that a lot of other shows like full house would have avoided um like th there's definitely a couple of times where um, there's an episode, for example, um, early in season one where Clarissa thinks her parents are going to have another baby. Um, and so it, it actually brings up topics like um, her parents sexual needs. <laughs> like it's such a it's such a strange thing to think about, but it's things that we all understood at that age. Um, and and um, and it wasn't afraid to talk about them where where a, a show like full house was just so so um sexless <laughs> it was sexless for sure um but it was it was so i can't think of the right the right word but um it was it was so aiming for wholesome that there's just topics that you couldn't even, or like words that you couldn't even mention. You know how many times like a cartoon will completely avoid the the use of the word kill or die? Like if you really think about it, they those words never show up in cartoons. Like yeah, for set, young set, kids. 
You're, yeah, you're, Vegeta's sending him to another dimension. Yeah, who are you trying to fool, Dragon Ball Z? Exactly. Um, and then in in the very first episode of Clarissa Explains It All, she talks about murdering her brother and how he needs which, to, to be fair, a brother. Which, to be fair, a brother like Ferguson, we would all be thinking that at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so the the fact that it like it took on topics, uh, you know, that were just you know, a lot of other shows were just sort of skirting around at the time and it it actually, you know, didn't didn't hesitate and kind of brought them up in in a way that any one of us would have reacted to them at that age. Um the the only real hang up that I had with rewatching it is that the the sibling dynamic I know it's supposed to be funny. I know it's 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 part of the major thing is that Clarissa and Ferguson don't get along and Ferguson's really annoying and you're supposed to basically side with Clarissa all the time. But really, every time they're in a room together, I just cringe a lot because I get that siblings don't always get along, but like it's such an overdramatic sibling relationship to the point where like I'm not really that entertained by it. And believe me, I have a sibling I actually don't get along with. And we were never like that. And it's really over the top for the sake of television, but it was just like, oh man, it was really such a product of its time for their dynamic to be that oh, dramatic. Now, there's a question that, that, that I want to ask with that, because like you mentioned, you, you have a sibling that you don't get along with. Um, you think maybe the reason why that sibling dynamic that they display on the show kind of doesn't really ring true to you is because you might be looking at it now with an adult perspective whereas watching it as kids maybe that that they that the, the show writers were writing that dynamic specifically to be re- relatable from a child's perspective because one of the things that's so easy to forget is that kids and adults will look at the same thing and see two very different things just based on you know their their life experiences and their perspectives so do you think maybe that the the reason why that sibling dynamic doesn't really ring true with you anymore is that maybe it's because you're 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 looking at it from an adult's perspective and you maybe don't really remember seeing that what seeing that what, ugh, getting tongue tied here what seeing that as a child was like. That's probably true. To be honest, um, it, I'm taking it from like my point of view, which was I have a sibling that I haven't gotten along with since we were quite young. And we were more of a Cold War relationship where, like, we don't we don't get along, which just means we don't talk to each other. We avoid each other at all times um, versus, you know, Clarissa and Ferguson, who they don't get along. So they are coming up with these elaborate plans to sabotage one another. And it always backfires. Um, I guess part of it is my annoyance with the character of Ferguson because he's, you know, he's supposed to be annoying. Genuinely. But it's also that, like, the parents always seem to side with Ferguson because he's a suck-up. And, um, like, I just don't buy it. <laughs> he's, he's so awful. And for the parents to never, ever, ever see, to be able to, for them to never read him as sucking up and lying all the time just seems unrealistic to me um i probably enjoyed the dynamic as a kid um but i just it it to me now as an adult it's really cringy okay and uh, the other show you picked was uh, are you afraid of the dark so what, what what drew you to that one? Oh my god i think it's because we're, weren't we recently talking about unsolved mysteries yeah <laughs> um and, and i think um like most of my friends are horror fans of some kind and unsolved mysteries is one of those reasons why we're all horror fans um and i think part of my interest in unsolved mysteries probably stemmed from are you afraid of the dark because it was a show that was actually directed at kids that actually got kind of scary and I don't remember most episodes. What I remember is all those kids sitting around the fire and they're all telling a spooky story and they say, submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society. I call this one the tale of something. And we can all still remember that exact phrase. You know, this show started in 1990. (laughs) 
I probably haven't watched it since probably 98 or 99, and I still remember that exact phrase. Um, like to a T. Oh, and... this is this will be funny. First episode aired October 31st, 1990. I mean, so this how... show premiered on Halloween. <laughs> how perfect is that? Um, and it's just I think that episode was actually supposed to be set on Halloween as well. Um, anyway, so I th I think it it informs a lot of uh, the personalities of the people I know that a lot of us watched this show when we were young. I think that's what drew me to rewatching it because I don't know anybody who like doesn't go, oh man, are you afraid of the dark? That was awesome. Even if the episodes were terrible, we're still going to have those rose-colored glasses looking back at Are You Afraid of the Dark? Because it it was horror that we were allowed to watch, and parents didn't really care that much. Um, I, I don't... Well, maybe your parents would have said something, but I don't know anybody whose parents were like, Now this is too much, and you're not allowed to watch it. I, I wasn't allowed to watch it when it first started airing, but it wasn't because of the content. It was because it came on after my bedtime. Oh, that makes sense. And then Cause I that, probably because I think because I because I think it premiered uh, during the Saturday night snick block, which didn't start until eight until like eight p.m. And until I was eight years old, my bedtime was seven thirty. Yeah, I know, and, pathetic, right? Yeah, that's whereas I weird man. I wouldn't have watched it until like nineteen ninety six or nineteen ninety seven, at least. So I I didn't I don't think I watched this on SNCC. Uh we have a channel up in Canada called Y YTV and that's how we got it cuz YTV does a lot of syndication with uh Nickelodeon shows which fun fact this show's Canadian. It was filmed in BC and parts of Montreal. The lead guy, Gary I think his name is, um one of the lead members of the Midnight Society is a weatherman now on our local uh. national weather service, Ross Hull. And um, he did an another show called uh, Student Bodies, but arguably his most memorable work is Are You Afraid of the Dark? And uh, this show is fucking great. I remember I've got one crystal clear memory of this show um, because you said this was horror for children. Um, my grade eight teacher brought in something for Halloween and presumably he taped this off of y uh, off of y YTV or maybe it was Nick at that time. But the episode was there was a monster in a pool. And the monster is all covered in this red goo and this amazing makeup effect. Now, I may be remembering it through the lenses of nostalgia. But I remember at the time thinking, that's a really, really good makeup effect. Especially for a children's show. Because at this time, because uh, this would have been in the 90s, the X-Files was filming in... Uh, BC as well and if you know anything about Canadian television um, a lot of crews tend to work together up here so odds are if you're working on X-Files you might be working on Stargate you might be working on this that and the other thing so whoever was directing a lot of the Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes the behind the scenes crew was fantastic like this show had a lot bigger of a production budget than I think a lot of people probably realize I think it just it looked way better than it should, and it's not often Canadian television can say that up until really the la maybe last fi 15 years or so. Um, but yeah, Are You Afraid of the Dark is one of the greatest things, and even the reboot wasn't ha half bad. It actually got picked up for a second season a couple of months ago, but obviously they haven't shot it yet because, you know, the apocalypse. See, my thing with Are You Afraid of the Dark is I always confuse it with the Goosebumps TV show. Which is also Canadian, but is also terrible. Um, <laughs> which features uh, the... You and I will have to agree to disagree on that, but that's a discussion for a different table. But anyway, Kat, uh, continue. Right. So there's, as far as I understand, there is no overarching plot. It is literally just a story, like a horror story after a horror story, much as you would have like reading the Goosebumps books, which were huge at the time. Um, so... It, it very much fed a culture of um, young horror fans and rewatching the this show like you really gotta wonder where they were coming up with these fucking stories because they are nightmare fuel I'm just putting that out there that 
I see it and I'm watching it and I'm going, oh, okay, this is really, really cheesy. But if I put myself in in the perspective of somebody who's like eight years old or nine years old or even ten, like this is fucking nightmare fuel. <laughs> like the, the, it's so creepy. Oh my god, the the stories are just so wild. And and what what I think really makes it what really drives the horror is that these are stories that are being told by kids to other kids. So they are not these really um, inaccessible concepts like uh, like eldritch horror or anything like that. They are deliberately designed to for the the audience children to project onto the characters described in these stories. So they're very accessible to the audience as horror. So it's like, okay, so there was an episode where one of the kids was like, hey, I just I just had to move and start at a new school and that really sucked. So I decided to write a horror story about going to a new school and then it turns out, oh, there's something really weird happening at the school and there's a monster in the basement. And that shit is so relatable because so many kids have had to start at a new school or they get a new neighbor and the neighbors are vampires. I mean, obviously that's not happening in real life. But, you know, you move and, and, and it's going over these actual life events that kids um, go through and can relate to and then putting horror in those everyday things. And I think that's just what makes it so good. You know, even as an adult, I, I can still go, oh, yeah, yeah, if I was a kid in this this TV show, I'd be freaked out because this is this is not an OK time. Um <laughs> But I, I think one of the other charming things was that there was a cast of characters telling these stories, even if that cast rotated a bit. Um, you could see the patterns of, well, this particular person tells these kinds of stories and this person tells these kinds of stories. Um, and so you have like a, a sense of familiarity with them um, while the the actual characters in the stories rotate and change. But I think you kind of felt like you were part of their group. And I don't know anybody who didn't want to be part of the Midnight Society. Even if we didn't, like, make up our own spooky stories. I feel like we all kind of wanted to be there. Like, we wanted to be there in person around the campfire. Telling and listening to these stories. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. I really enjoyed Are You Afraid of the Dark? Even though, like... Some of it is a little silly, and some of these special effects are obviously not up to today's standards, but at the time, the stories are so out there, um, and, and yet fairly humble. Um, weird concepts with humble beginnings, and then just, yeah, different story week to week, pretty easy to follow. Spooky as shit. So good. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, it's, it's it's interesting that you brought up for both of your shows how they how they tended to to, to be kind of daring and, and do stuff that other shows weren't doing. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that for the first like you know twenty years up until maybe like the the, the late nineties to early two thousands, Nickelodeon wasn't really a a, a a network that was really taken seriously. Um, so they were able to really you know do and get away with a lot of things that you wouldn't really see them do today. Uh, case in point, uh, the show that I picked, Rocco's Modern Life. Uh, created by Joe Murray, who some of you young bucks will remember as uh, will know as the creator of Camp Laszlo, and uh, it was it, it was an animated series, and it came off it came out uh, on the heels of Ren and Stimpy, so it had a lot of that kind of kind of gross out humor, more outland you know kind of deranged uh, animation type humor. But what I was really amazed because um, that was why I liked it as a kid, but going back and watching it as an adult, what uh, what amazes me now is how they managed to juxtapose that with things that speak to young adults because the the, the central conceit of Rocco Rocco's modern life and Rocco as a character is you know he's just striking out on his own as an adult and the first like couple seasons are really about him dealing with the fact that he's out on his own now and adjusting to that like the first episode uh, that I was able to see uh, on the Amazon Prime thing was about how, like, you know, he has no food in his house, but he's also got no money to go grocery shopping uh, until he sees an ad in the paper that his grocery store is having, like, a 99% off sale. And so there's all these kinds of wacky hijinks that ensue, but they're all based around these very relatable things that a lot of, that, you know, speak to a lot of young adults. Like, you know, 
you know, having to having to spend a day at the laundromat, having to uh, go on your, your first road trip with friends or, you know, dealing with being sick while you're out on your own uh, for the first time in your life. And it, it I was really surprised at how that juxtaposition caused the show to hold up really well. Like there's an episode that deals with credit card debt. And this is a kid's show in the early 90s. And, you know, I can't think of any other show that, you know, even now that has dealt with that and managed to be so entertaining about it. Although I got to tell you, it was, it was, a, it was, <laughs> it was a, a shot in the nostalgia because, uh, you know, of course this came out in the nineties and, uh, back in those, in, in the late eighties and early nineties, back in those, if you wanted to pay with a credit card, you didn't just swipe the stripe on the machine and the computer would do its thing. No, they would take your card and put it on this, like this machine that they would rack a slide on it, like a shotgun and take a rubbing of your credit card. So when I saw that in the episode, I was like, oh man, I haven't seen one of those in years. Um, and it was, it was, it was, it was an interesting to go back and, and look at some of the stuff that they did in this series that again, uh, you wouldn't see them try and do nowadays. Like, you know, there's a one-off gag where Rocco's trying to find a job after he gets laid off. And there's one-off gag where he winds up getting a job at a phone sex line. <laughs> Um, there's an episode where Heifer winds up choking on a chicken bone and goes to what is essentially hell and meets the devil or peaches as he's called. <laughs> and it's, it was, it's, it's such a hysterical show because I love off the wall and deranged stuff like that. But again, uh, so much of it is grounded in these young adult, uh, fears and, and, and issues that, you know, you will deal with, you know, striking out on your own, uh, for the first time out of high school or college. And it was, it was something that, Flew over my head as a kid, uh, but watching it now made me appreciate the show so much more. Um, because a- again, this is stuff that that's still that you know the the, the gross out humor and the wacky stuff. You know, it still makes me laugh. It still makes the inner child in me laugh. But the fact that it's all grounded around these these real world issues that people in my age group are grappling with, you know, it 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 made me find kind of a kind of a kind of a comfort and also kind of kind of find a bit of the humor in uh you know having to deal with some of these what are really rather mundane situations like you know hey maybe you know this is kind of you know not such an awful thing after all if i'm making any sense whatsoever um so you know it's 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 really it's it's really a very strange beast to go back and watch um and what's interesting to me is going back and watching it, especially after watching the Set It Cling special that came out last year, which talked about how, you know, things change and how how culture changes over over time and adjusting to that. And I, I really think that if, if there were, if Rocco's Modern Life were to get a full-on revival nowadays, I think it would hold up really well, just based on sort of, based on the subject matter that it, it chooses to top, to tackle and the the wacky way that it chooses to do so, um, but I mean, Rocco's Modern Life was one of my favorite shows as a kid. Like I said, just because of that weird and wacky humor, and I I think now that looking at it as an adult, I think I understand why I was allowed to watch this and not Ren and Stimpy because if you, because Ren and Stimpy was very much built around being shocking for the sake of being shocking. Uh, whereas Rocco's Modern Life, yeah, it had the it is shocking moments, but it also had actual heart and stories to tell and cleverly written characters. So, you know, it, 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 it was, it was an absolute joy for me to go back and watch the show. And I loved every moment of it. Um, and I really would like to find a complete, uh, DVD or Blu-ray copy of it somewhere that had the show as it originally aired, because according to my research, all of the, uh, the DVD releases have had content cut. Um, so they're not, as they originally aired, which really kind of disappoints me. So I don't know. I may just have to hoist the colors on that one. But uh, yeah, so that's a, that's the show I picked. Uh, Mike, now you picked uh, something a little uh, a little differently from me and Kat. So what was the show that you decided to rewatch? All right. Well, children, gather around the fireplace. And as we're going to tell you a tale that begins in 1986. That's right. Back when Nickelodeon was just beginning uh, to really start in earnest its original programming. And that was the children's game show 
Double Dare. That's right. This is a show that has aired for over 600 episodes from 1986 till just recently, 2019, where the show was canceled after its two season uh, revival, which did back did did bring back original host Mark Summers, who you may uh, remember from Double Dare. He's done stuff with the Food Network. He's always been around. He's almost always been associated with every alliteration of Double Dare minus Double Dare uh, 2000. So what this show is, is, like I said, it is a children's game show where simply uh, put you are you and your team of players usually uh, two players, um, or sometimes it's two players and their mother or father. But they've even had WWE superstars. A memorable episode had Mr. Perfect and Hacksaw Jim Duggan, uh, Gorilla Monsoon, and uh, Bobby the Brain Heenan was on there. But they've also had, I think, uh, the Bella Twins showed up. Lou Ferrigno and Weird Al were on there. So, yeah, it's weird. But, yeah, so what would happen is you would go out, you would answer trivia questions. However, if you couldn't answer that question, you could pass it over to them. And you could you could say, all right, I bet you can't answer it. And then if they couldn't, they could double dare you. And then it would eventually end up where if neither team could answer it, you could take a physical challenge, which might resemble... Here, I'm going to put you in a hula hoop and we're going to throw water balloons at you. And how many go through the hoop? Or here is a roll of toilet paper. We're going to make a mummy out of you. Or here, you have to uh, put a slime bucket on your head and pour that slime bucket onto your other person's head and try and fill it up within uh, 30 seconds or something like that. And eventually, the players with the highest amount of money or points at the end of the first round would go to the obstacle course where you may have to pick a giant nose uh, of its boogers and get get a flag or uh, go through a set of teeth or climb this giant um, slide thing where you'd have to go through slime. There'd be like a a pit at the bottom filled with like, I don't know, like whipped cream and other weird shit. Um, And there'd be like a giant one ton hamster wheel. You'd have to run until uh, eventually so many parts lit up and you would win. You could win things like a gift certificate. Usually a really big prize was a trip to space camp or a vacation, stuff like that. Um, weird little bit of trivia. There have been international versions of Double Dare, which were in Australia. There was a French Canadian version as well. There's even an adult version, which featured a, um, then known as Bruce, uh, Caitlyn Jenner was the host with Scott Bayo, which was random and they could win a Ferrari or a convertible or something stupid like that. It didn't get past the pilot, but they did try to do it because that's how popular Double Dare was. Because the show was really easy to produce in 1986, they actually rented a studio out in Philadelphia and they would film five episodes a day, which means they could really kind of figure out what was working. So they could air the show every single day. And when the show started out, it had a 0.6 rating, which if you know how the Nielsen system rating works, that's not a whole hell of a lot of people. By the end of the week, they tripled their numbers. It became the fastest growing cable television show. It may even be in history. And it was huge for Nickelodeon. People were watching it all the time. Um, Job offers for Mark Summer started coming in in left, right, and center. And Nickelodeon's like, damn, we've got a hit on our hands. And it was just this amazing phenomenon to be alive and there was so much double dare merchandise there was a double dare nintendo game you could buy like walkie talkies toys you get the physical challenges um kit stuff like that um i know uh in part of the research i was doing this that uh that uh, youtube channel i mentioned pop arena you there were college campuses where people were holding their own college versions of double dare there was even a traveling show that you could go to that would go to Los Angeles, New York and other places like that where they would do it. When the show got moved down to Florida, it became a part of universal studios, Florida. So you could watch the show being filmed. You could even potentially get called in to be a participant. Usually they just draw from the kind of local area too. So Double Dare did something just so innovative that it made the children's game show popular. Sure, there had been ones in the 50s, 60s, and and uh, later, but none had captured the imagination 
of that and it really elevated Nickelodeon to being a really popular channel because advertisers came knocking and they wanted in on this like it was huge because a lot of cable networks and satellite uh, channel providers gave Nickelodeon as just part of their packages anyway so advertisers like damn we can make some real money here and Nickelodeon was able to profit off that so now- so, so something I don't know if your if your research yielded, but this is an interesting tidbit that I turned up because mm. um, I I get occasionally get bored and I'll just go on on website trolls looking for stuff and I'll just hit up a whole bunch of random shit. Um, and one day I went on a double dare kick and just went reading up everything I could on the show. But originally the show wasn't going to have any cash prizes. Yes, because and, of taxes. Yeah, that that, that that this is this. So the prizes were all chosen specifically to appeal to kids, but then they were like, "Okay, wait a minute, hang on, they're going to have to pay taxes on this." So that's when they introduced the cash prizes. Because what confused me one time watching the show as an adult was like, you know, these cash prizes—they're only getting like maybe like you know a hundred to two hundred bucks. This is pretty small, you know. This is like chump change. Uh, and then I went looking, and it's like you know, the, the the prizes were were given out. The cash prizes were just so to cover the taxes of the material prizes i was like oh that's actually really clever yeah um i think i think in the research that i came across if you happen to play particularly well and you hit everything possible you could probably get four hundred dollars and four hundred dollars to a 10 year old is like giving them a million right so oh, yeah, especially in the 90s oh yeah so your dollar went really damn far so you could do cool things but the but some of the prizes were as i mentioned you could get a toys or a gift certificate here's a savings bond here's a radio but you would get cool things like going to space camp my god i wanted to go to space camp so friggin' bad because it looks so cool and as far as i know it is still operating um which is just really 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 neat um but yeah double dare had just accomplished something that nobody had done before it became so wildly popular that fox picked it up it produced family double dare um and then the show just suddenly stopped in 1993 and then it ran in reruns until 1999 and then double dare 2000 came back with a new host new set new challenges although the obstacle course was now the slopstacle course and there's a monkey that could do backflips because year 2000 um it lasted like 65 uh, episodes i think it didn't last that long and then it went dormant for a really 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 long time um but there was like um a show that that like you could do i think it was a i think it was at the nick hotel which i think they i think they closed in like 2016 or something and then the show and then the show was revived in 2018 and mark summers came back which was really 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 awesome which uh, can, we, can we talk about Mark Summers for a second and how he was yes. basically the face of Nickelodeon for a while? Because oh, yeah. I think at one point he had three shows running concurrently on the network. He had he had Double Dare, he had What Would You Do, and then I swear to God there was a third one. I can't remember yeah. for the life of me what it was called, and people think I'm crazy when I when I say it, but no, there was a third Mark Summers show on Nickelodeon. Someone please tell me what it was. Didn't he do Legends of the Hidden Temple? No, that was Kurt no. Fogg. Yeah. Oh. But yeah, Mark Summers was everywhere, and he had this ability to be really charming with the kids to put them at ease when they were doing it he just had a very natural charisma that after like the first couple of episodes of the first season just became so natural to him and networks headhunted him headhunted him hard but he say but he said no stayed the course and he stuck with double dare for many of its um alliterations i think he's been executive producer he's had many different hats on over there and he's his career itself has been very 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 interesting he's never he, he's never been boring like he's a guy i'd love to talk to not just about double dare but his work with um the food network and stuff like that he he gets around um and one weird little bit of trivia is mark summers doesn't he's he's ocd now and that's hardcore OCD hardcore OCD which is funny for a guy who was on one of the messiest game shows ever but at that time he wasn't diagnosed yet so that's where there's a little bit of a kind of disconnect there but seriously children's television would not be the way it is 
without Mark Summers and Double Dare. And I think the guy's name was uh, Greg Darby, I think it was. The president of Nickelodeon, Geraldine. I can't remember her last name off the top of my head. But that Nickelodeon was such a powerhouse for so long. And it's only in the last couple of years that it's no longer the number one children's network. It's only second to, I think, Disney and something else now because it's kind of slipped from its once powerful podium. But... Nick, Nick has accomplished a lot. It's had the shows that we've all mentioned, stuff like Rugrats, Wild Thornberries, the aforementioned Ren and Stimpy, um, and I, Avatar. I guess that, and I guess that's it, because that, that, we're running, we're kind of running close to the end of the show here. I guess that, that's a good way to close out the show. What are some other random things from Nickelodeon that uh, you remember from when you were a kid? So, Kat, let's start with you. What's what 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 what's some what's some random thing from Nickelodeon that 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 you really miss or that you really remember from when you were a kid? Um, I th- I think my two other favorite shows, and I'm really honing in on the live action shows over the cartoons for whatever reason. But um, guts. Yeah, because that was another competitive show, and I realized like I would never be able to be on that show because once you have to do the aggro crag, I'd be like, nope, nope, nope. Fun, um, fun, fun fact: one of my game collecting friends actually has one of the shards of the aggro crag that they would give out at the end of the show as a trophy. Damn, that's so cool. Um, but I, I, I always love the "Do you have it? Do 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 you have it?" guts, and I'd be like, no, I don't. I could never do that. I'm like 14, and be like, no, never. Um, and then the other show that I really, really wish we had more time to talk about is Legends of the Hidden Temple, because that show was so much fun. Um, it, you know, it's another show where it's like I would never make it past any of those things. Um, but every once in a while at a convention, you see people in costumes of one of the teams. That's awesome. And I'm like, oh, it's so good because it's one of those things that truly only 90s kids will get. Blue Barracudas for life! (laughs) Somewhere in Texas, Brian is now unexplainably angry. He has no idea why. (laughs) you like you projected on your team and you like oh no they're gonna get captured by the guys oh my god yeah it was just like it was like a heart palpitating right at the end of it i i had a friend who for halloween one year he went as one of the temple guards and i and i and i and i and i told him in no uncertain terms i swear to god if you jump out at me once in that costume i will shoot you dead because that was how much the temple guards scared me as a kid (laughs) Uh, Birdman, what about you? What's something random that you remember uh, from Nickelodeon as a kid? Uh, I was very much like Kat, a fan of the live action shows. And there are two. One I'm going to mention really quick because I've got three. One was Salute Your Shorts. That show I thought was pretty clever. But two shows I love. You can't do that on television because it showed me just a whole different weird realm of comedy that I'd never, ever seen before. Also, and, fun fact, that's where the Nickelodeon slime came from. Yep. Uh, and uh, it has been iconic of the brand ever since. Um, and then the other show that I loved was a show called Hey Dude, which featured <laughs> a bunch of kids on a dude ranch. And it just, it felt, I don't know, just for some reason, it really, really resonated with me. And I've always been a bigger fan of Nick's live action stuff because I never seen all that i've never seen the roundhouse because i fell out of nickelodeon when my parents took over the satellite dish in like 1997 and i was reduced to over the air antenna and vhs tapes so i missed out on a lot of the really cool shit until the age of torrenting and dvds yeah i remember hey dude uh i remember the show itself bore me to tears but that you know again talk talking about nickelodeon music that theme song still slaps i i know that music by heart it's a little, yeah. a little strange when you make your home out on the range. Okay, the random thing from Nickelodeon that I really remember, and this was this would have been like like if if I got to take part in this, I could just die because I would have I would have nothing. Uh, there would be no greater thing for me to achieve. The Nickelodeon toy shop toy shop aramas, where they would basically take a kid, give him a cart, put him in a Toys R Us, and he would have I think like one minute to go throughout the whole store and anything that he could get into the cart and still make it to the finish line, he would get to keep. And I remember I wanted to do that so bad. That was like, 
you know, the big the big childhood dream. Like, you know, other kids, like, you know, I, I, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a doctor. I want to go on the Nickelodeon shop Arama. That's what I want to do. And just, like, tear through the video game section. <laughs> There's a fun thread on Reddit that I re- remember reading, like, I guess a few months ago. Read about people who won their school gets taken over by Nick. And you get a weird slap shot of how Nickelodeon would take over their school for like a day. Parents got slimed. Teachers got slimed. Oh, man. It's intense. And I'm jealous of you Americans for having interactivity like this. Because honestly, the 90s and Nickelodeon were a magical time to be alive. And even I think in the 2000s, the kids still got it. And even Nickelodeon today still puts out some really, really good stuff. So... Yeah, but it's it's, it's, it's monumental channel. It's it's still a shadow of the golden age that it was in the nineties. But um, you know, like we mentioned, there's so much to talk about about nineties Nick uh, and even some early two thousands Nick that you know we just don't have time for. Maybe we'll come back and do a part two on this. You know, later on down the line, maybe we'll do a, a Nick shows part two. But anyway, that is all the time that we have for Nerd of the Third Power this week. What is a Nickelodeon show or piece of history? Uh, that you really remember fondly. Sound off in the comments, and uh, yeah, we like I said, we've had. I think we've had a lot of fun with this. I don't know. Like I said, yeah, I'm seriously thinking we might do a part two on this at some point. But anyway, that is all the time that we have for Nerd to the Third Power this week. Thank you as always for tuning in. We will see you guys next time. As always, I'm Doctor Gonzo. I'm the cat. I'm the bird man. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Taka, play us out. He's the bird man. He, he, he's the bird man. Guts.